So it's not 
much good for studying uh, the movements of the articulators. But recently there have been developed methods that can take pictures tens of times per second. So it's getting on for, for, for real-time uh, imaging. And so you can get uh, images which look like this. So this is um, an articulation of now image to the same level. And so you get a, get, a, get a sense of where the, the, the tongue is moving through, through the articulation, but again, we've got a, a, the resolution in terms of uh, distances is not very good, and the resolution in terms of time is still not very good, it's always getting better. Another problem with, with these MRIs is that actually the video should be played like this, because the person is lying on their back, not the the actual recording should be, should be viewed like this. So the problem about measuring, if we're going to instrument speech and measure speech, the problem with articulation is that we've seen is that either it's very dangerous, like with x-rays, or it interferes with speaking, putting things inside your mouth, it interferes with movements of the articulators, uh, or these machines at the moment, although they've still a lot of promise, they still don't have the resolution that we need in time and space to give us detailed uh, descriptions of articulation. And also you can see we've only got a mid-sagittal section, we've only got a cross-section through the head like this, whereas of course we know the tongue, the sides of the tongue are quite important as well, but we're just looking at the mid -line. So for these reasons, we've really, really historically focused on sounds instead, and when we're studying and measuring speech, we're interested in measuring the sounds. And uh, the sort of applications we're going to mention now and later in the, in the talk is that we're interested in how can we understand from the sounds the phonetic variation that, that occurs, um, how can we use measurements of the sound to test hypotheses about how speech is used in communication, how can we use the sound to uh, measurements of the sound to provide you feedback to, to, to learners, say learners of a, a, um, a second language, or how can we use that measurements to build applications like speech recognition systems or speaker recognition systems um, and uh, uh, or conversational agents like uh, Alexa and Siri and so on. So what I'm going to do in this talk is, is basically just focus on four different um, visual representations of speech and show you what you can learn about speech from looking at these visual representations of speech. This is going to be the waveforms of pitch track, the spectrum and the spectrum band. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about how one particular application of this idea to uh, pronunciation. Um, so mostly, this uh, this lecture is about demonst is about demonstrations. There's not uh, not too many slides, and uh, basically I'm trying to show, show you what you can see in these particular types of types of representation. So we'll start with a uh, waveform. So we're waveforms or waveforms of ways of representing sounds in terms of uh, graph, several sounds, sounds of very rapid uh, and very small fluctuations in air pressure. So when I'm speaking, I'm changing the air pressure in this room. And I can pick up those, uh, those pressure fluctuations with a device like this, which is just a microphone that converts those pressure fluctuations into a voltage that I can display on the screen. So, so if we can we run a um, sort of an oscilloscope display, and as I'm speaking, I'm now modifying the, the, the air pressure in this room, and this microphone is converting those modifications of air pressure into an electrical signal. So if I make a nice sound, and freeze the display, you can see that some of the time, so this sort of central line would represent atmospheric pressure, okay? And some of the time when I'm speaking, I'm making the atmospheric pressure in the room go above normal, and sometimes I'm making the atmospheric pressure in the room go below normal. So overall, I'm not changing the total pressure in the room, but sometimes I'm making it go up slightly, and sometimes I'm making it go down slightly. So, so this here, I'm quiet. That kind of represents atmospheric pressure. Uh, e, I can make a sound, and uh, then I'm making that atmospheric pressure fluctuate. And these are very tiny fluctuations. If you ever thought about how big sounds are, but they're really, really small. I mean, unbelievably small. So that central line, atmospheric pressure, is 100,000 pascals, 100,000 newtons per square meter, 10 tons for every square meter of the Earth's surface, it's a very, very high pressure. And this sound is about 0.1 of a pascal, in other words, that's about a millionth of atmospheric pressure. 
a typical sound, the sound that I'm making is quite a quiet sound, a loud sound that I'm making, uh, modifies abstract pressure by about one part in a million. And in fact, sounds that we get, the quietest sounds that we can perceive are a thousand times smaller than that. So we can perceive sound as only one part in a billion of that abstract pressure. And that's, that we should be staggered by that, because that's amazing that our ears are so sensitive to sounds that they can pick up these So what can we see about speech in a waveform? So one obvious thing we can see is we can look at a relatively quiet sound and a relatively loud sound. So here's the first sound. <coughs> okay, something nice and small. So a relatively small waveform and a nice loud sound. Ah, oh, big, big waveform. And the size of these fluctuations, you will not be surprised to find, is related to the loudness of the sound. So the bigger these pressure fluctuations, the louder the sound. That we so now this is one of the attributes we give to, to our perception of sound. We hear sounds, we can put them on a scale of soft to loud. Another thing you can notice about speech sounds on a waveform is that some of them have this repetitive structure like this one. You can see this is by a bit of a vowel sound R. <coughs> and you can see that it repeats. Interesting. So if you get another sound, shh, um, it seem to be any repetition there. So the whole lot of sounds which don't really have any kind of repetition to them. And other sounds e, a, m, a, which do seem to have repetition to them. So one <coughs> excuse me. Um, So one key aspect of speech sounds is that some of these sounds we can say are periodic. They, they repeat, they have a shape which repeats periodically. They have a cycle that they go through and the sound repeats. <coughs> and other sounds are aperiodic, or and they don't have some, some kind of repetitive structure. Shh. <coughs> like a shirt sound. And I guess you've I guess you've already caught on about the difference between those sounds that have a periodic structure and those that don't. Is that those that have a periodic structure, the sound source, the sound that's generating the, the, the sound in the first place, is the larynx vibrating. And because the larynx is vibrating regularly, the sound vibrates regularly. Because the, 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 the larynx vibrates, vibrates periodically, the sound that comes out of your mouth is periodic as well. And Again, if, you, again, if you're, you're following the idea, then that means that we take the difference between a low pitch sound and a high pitch sound. We know that's to do with the rate of vocal cord vibration. So a low pitch sound, uh, you see that these cycles are coming relatively infrequently. So these thin lines here, you can see them are five milliseconds apart. So from here to here, it's about nine milliseconds, so nine thousandths of a second. So that's vibrating 110 times per second. If I go for a higher pitch sound, uh, uh, then I'm now vibrating to see that this can now come down to what we say that about six six milliseconds. So my vibration six thousandths of a second, so my my larynx is vibrating at sixty times per second. So uh, that the other second sort of dimension of sound, pitch, is related to repetition frequency. If we've got a sound which is periodic then uh, the, the durations of those periods, or the number of those periods per second, <coughs> tell us the pitch of the sound, or gives us the sensation of the pitch of the sound. So then when we're focusing on pitch, let's just try and, let's try and go to our second uh, graph, which is uh, called the pitch track. And in a pitch track, what we're trying to do is simply to extract this number. Is, are my vocal cords <coughs> operating 110 times per second, or are they, are they operating 160 times per second? What now, how many, what's the frequency of vibration? So in this graph, we're going to plot this frequency of vibration here, which is 50, 100, 150, 200. That's the number of repetitions per second my vocal cords are vibrating against time. Okay. So let's just see what that looks like. So now as I'm speaking, uh, this system is working out the rate of vibration of my vocal folds. And plotting this on a graph that's carrying on as carrying on as flowing across the screen as I'm, as I'm speaking. So I have a relatively 
And what I've done here is break up that sound into lots of its individual components. In fact, it's broken it up into 39 different components. And I can show you that 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 that, that was being successful because if I add those 39 components back together again, I get this waveform, and this waveform sort of looks like that waveform. So I can play the original sound, and I can also play this sound which is being taken apart and then put back together again from its elementary components. You see it's slightly more mechanical, whereas it's the original, this is the this synthetic form, um, but basically it has the same timbre. When we try to catch a timbre or something. What I can do is I can play all these elementary components. Right? So I do. There's 39 of those, and when you have those 39 elementary components and you play them all at the same time, right, then you get this. Okay. So that's the idea. We take a sound, we break it up into its elementary components, then all we need to do is to measure the height of each one of these components, measure the amplitude of each one of these components, and we capture the timbre. Those 39 numbers, which would be the amplitude of each of those frequencies, we have captures the timbre of that. That's the trick. So let me show you that working with, uh, with a real uh, uh, scoop sound. <coughs> so this graph of the amplitude against the, 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 the identity of these frequency components is called a spectrum. And so on this horizontal axis will be these, the frequency of all these elementary components. And on the vertical axis will be how much of that component is present in the sound at some particular time. So what I'm doing here is uh, just plopped it out just to keep it nice and simple for the moment, but this is an R sound and you can see that it has um, uh, quite a bit of energy in, in, uh, in, in this particular frequency region, so we have nice tall bars, not so much energy here, so shorter bars, more energy up here. Here, we contrast that with E. Then we have a slightly different sounds. So we, we have a much bigger chunk here in the middle than we had before, and uh, this bit has gone down to a, to a, a lower frequency. And another and a different sound again. Ooh, has a different, uh, a different distribution. These different sounds, these sounds have different timbres, have different amounts of these basic frequencies. Do that in slightly more detail, slightly more confusing picture, but just to show you what this looks like. <coughs> uh, so this is the R sound. Now we've got a lot more sort of looking at, you actually see the actual individual components now. These little fine lines in here uh, represent the individual frequency components in the sound. And uh, we can check that too. That was an R, wasn't it? So, e is a slightly different uh, distribution of these components, amplitude of these components. Mm -hmm. So our ear is analyzing these, the sound into these elementary components and passing the signal onto the brain to say how much of each component is present in the sound. And that's what gives the sensation of sound. There's a kind of a, a little sort of side note that's, that I think is quite fun to, to, to show, which is how do we make differences between E and R and U? And why is the sound different between E and R and U? And talk about that. So we've been doing lots of phonetics this past couple of weeks. We know about E and we can make E and R and U sounds. But we talk about why is it, what is it going on inside your vocal trap? And what's the sound that our sound is going on? And if you think about what's happening is that is that the larynx is doing the same thing in all three of those sounds. The larynx is just making a buzzing sound. Right. And what's happening is that that buzzing sound is being passed along this pipe which extends between the larynx and the lips. And this pipe has different shapes for E and R and U. And the consequence is that when the sound passes through that pipe, the sound is changed by the pipe. The pipe changes the timbre of the sound. So the timbre of the sound that came out of the larynx buzz is modified by, as the physics proceeds through the pipe. I'll give you a very simple demonstration, demonstration of that idea. So I've got a, um, a little, uh, this is a 
a duck call. This is just going to make my buzzing sound. And I've got some pipes. Very bits of plumbing here. Um, so this is uh, a bit of uh, 15 mil black padding and a bit of 28 mil black base pack. We've got all these two around and stuff. Um, and uh, all I'm going to do is take this buzzing sound and go through this pipe. And the idea is this that the, this buzzing sound, when you hear it directly from the, from the duct wall, has one timbre. When you play through this pipe, it's a different timbre. That's really what's happening in the room. Well, that sounds quite bad, right? So that is that's the that's the turning what well, is just a buzzing sound into something a bit like a round pot, more like a round pot. Got a couple of ears. This is the, just the different pipe. So pipe is different uh, 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 specification in terms of its its lengths and its widths. So just like you moving your tongue and changing the shape of the vocal track pipe. And so that's again different. So that was when we started with, and we're now changing it to sounds a bit like a French U, or something like that, right? Something like that. Uh, and then we've got a different one here again. Again, a different configuration of pipe. And if you really want to be convinced that it's, that it's just, um, the larynx doesn't do anything, it does the same thing all about. So I can replace the larynx. See that the data is buzzer. And if I replace my larynx with a buzzer, so I just put a buzzer and reset. Awesome. Oops, not buzzing at all. Mm. Oh no, this back on. Oh well. Didn't come here anyway. Anyway. Okay, so uh, yeah, so if you replace your larynx with a buzzer, then you still say, oh, you know, it's what matters is the shape of the pipe, not what the, the larynx is doing the same thing. I mean, that's, that's the okay, so one last graph to go. So spectro is fine, it tells us the, the basic elementary components that are in the sound, but it's kind of like a snapshot. It's telling you about, telling you about the characteristics of the sound at one particular time. This was, this was the characteristic of the sound when I hit the space bar and I froze the sound. That's the characteristic at that particular time. Because we don't speak, say, with constant sound. We don't go up to people in the street and go, e, and they come back and go, and you go, and things like that. So we don't communicate by these constant sounds. Speech, we saw right at the beginning of the articulation, is continually moving. Our articulators are continuously on the move. They're smoothly moving from one, one shape to the next. And the sound is continually moving from one, from one timbre to the next. And changing the picture of that as well. <coughs> so what we need is a spectrum, but we need a spectrum with a time dimension. We need a spectrum which a graph which shows us how the spectrum of the sound changes with time. So we need to take this and, and, and convert it into a, into a time axis. That's exactly what a spectrogram is. So in the spectrogram, this horizontal axis now is time, and this vertical axis is now that frequency axis we saw in the spectrum. That's the, the frequencies of all the individual sound components in the sound. And then the amplitude scale of the spectrum, the bit which says how much of each component is present in the sound, is now encoded as a, a gray scale or a colored scale. So where there is darkness in this picture, that means there is a lot of amplitude of that particular frequency component at that particular time. When there's white spaces in this spectrogram, then there's very little energy and very little amplitude of those particular frequency components at that particular time. So we're seeing how the spectrum of the sound changes with time. And it's a very a pretty simple idea. All you do is you calculate the spectrum of the sound, but you calculate to say a thousand times per second, and then for each one of those uh, spectra, you convert them into a, a grey picture, a, a, a coloured picture. So you change the amplitude into a, into a grey scale. In this particular version, which is the traditional, traditional way of explaining spectrograms, then low amplitude is represented by white, and high amplitude is represented by black. And the reason we have that scale is that the original devices that were, that were, were built, the spectrograph devices for, for building these spectrograms, um, made these pictures by burning pieces of white paper. And so, so the background, the paper was originally white, 
and where there was energy in the signal, they burned the paper to make the paper black. So historically, although we don't use those machines anymore, we still have this this, uh, this nod to the history of spectrography by having white meaning no energy and black meaning lots of energy. And you think about it, it's probably not one way around, but, uh, but that's the that's always that the kind of So let me show you some um, some spectrograms then. Let's do some some steady state sounds to begin with. Uh, Here is our spectrogram, and you remember this, uh, this uh, uh, vertical axis is frequency, so we're saying that there is energy at one of the different frequencies in the sound, and that this horizontal axis is time. And if you look closely, you can see some very fine lines in here, vertical lines in here, and each one of those represents a vocal fold. So each one of those is a vocal fold to come together. So you can actually see each individual vocal fold closure. But you can also see these dark uh, uh, bands that are going horizontally across the picture, <clears throat> and these are the effect of the vocal track pipe on the larynx sound. The larynx buzz doesn't really have these, but these, these uh, horizontal bands, and the sound acquires those horizontal bands in its passage through the vocal track pipe. In fact, we can look at this picture and we can conclude what was the vocal track pipe doing to larynx buzz, and you get this sort of smooth. Uh, graph here, which really represents the influence of the vocal track pipe uh, on, on Larry's buzz. So if we try that for an R sound, if we try a different sound, e, e, then we get um, these bands have now moved in frequency, uh, representing the fact that the, the vocal track the pipe has changed shape, and that the, the effect of the pipe on Larry's buzz has, has changed. <coughs> If you've read any books on, on, on phonetics or on acoustic phonetics, you'll know that these horizontal bands have a very strange name that politicians give them, and these horizontal bands which really represent resonances of the vocal tract pipe are called formers, because, because they give form to sound. It's a stupid name, but there we go. So they're formers because they, form, they, they, they give form or timbre or quality to, to, to the sound. Um, Let's just try a few different sounds. Let's try some, some voiceless sounds. There's a nice sir sound. And you can see that sir sounds bright. It doesn't have a bright timbre. And that feels like a, a sound to lots of high frequencies. And indeed, the spectrogram has got most of the energy uh, at the top of the picture where the high frequencies are. And the sir sound seems darker and has energy which comes lower down in the, in the, in the spectrogram. Um, I think everybody has time. <coughs> Let's just quickly do a quick demo. <coughs> Speech. So I'm just going to record, um, record one word, which is speech here. And you can see it's got a, a sub sound, which we've just seen here at the beginning. Um, and we've got sort of an E type quality in the middle here. And we've got a sort of sh type quality. <coughs> The end is kind of what, what you expect, so here's a little puzzle for you. So if this whole phrase is speech and this bit is the sir part, then what English word is this bit? <laughs> Who goes for peach? Who knows their phonetics? It's not going to be aspirated, is it? Which means that it's going to sound like... Ooh, yes, we show you this and find out. Yeah, so the whole, remember the whole is speech. And this part is speech. 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 Yes, it's speech, right? Because we don't aspirate through that person. So we have that sound. We have that person. Otherwise, it would be speech. 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 So here's an example really where thinking about the sound and studying the form of the sound. Um, helps us understand more about the, the, the phonetic variety. And of course we can start to make measurements in this as well. We can measure frequencies, we can measure durations, we can measure where these forms go, we can measure how rapidly they change, and so on. We start to turn speech into numbers, which is uh, important for our uh, science.
scientific study of speech. So just to summarize those four graphs, um, waveform is this amplitude of sounds, uh, in the, you know, uh, uh, of air pressure against time. Pitch track is measuring repetition frequencies in that waveform as a function of time. A spectrum is measuring the amplitude of the individual frequency components in the sound as a function of frequency, but it doesn't have time in it. That's a problem because we want to see how the spectrum varies with time. And the spectrogram puts together the spectrum of time again, which shows us how the sound, the spectrum of the sound is evolving. I want to just do uh, Finish just by talking about some applications, in particular an application related to pronunciation. Um, so there are many applications of, of these ideas. That once we've converted speech into, uh, into sounds, and the sounds into numbers, we can study through uh, quantitative me me measurements how speech sounds vary across languages, across accents, across uh, speaking styles. Um, we can use them to assess and uh, monitor the progress of therapy in, in speech uh, pathology. Um, we can build computer devices which can uh, understand and recognize speech and synthesize speech and speak back to you. Um, and of course, we're and, and I think what we're particularly interested in today is, is methods for uh, giving you feedback on the quality of your pronunciation. So I just want to show you just broadly speaking, how you can build an application and how it can be built to talk to, to uh, look at pronunciation, uh, build a pronunciation training application. And the, and the trick basically is to take our waveform like, like, like this or our spectro spectrogram and then for every point in time try and work out which particular uh, phonetic sound or a particular phonological contrast really is, a, is present in the sound at any, in any particular time. So let me just try and show you this in a bit more detail. So I don't know if you can, it's probably few, too small for you to see, but, but up here there's a list of List of uh, sort of phone names here. So it goes Bertaka, Pataka, Mernanga, Ravanaga, Verdazaja, Fathasasha, and then held them back and stuff. So it's basically uh, of that vertical axis is one entry for every sort of uh, imaginary phone name in the language, if you like. In fact, I've got 35 of them uh, up there in this particular demonstration. And then these black bars here really represent the computer's idea of which sound is present at which particular time. Okay. And, the, and if the sound is if it's white, it says, I don't think that, I don't think this particular sound is present at this particular time. If it's dark, it's, I think this particular sound was present uh, at this particular time in the signal. <clears throat> so let's zoom in on one particular word and see if we can work out what the, what the word is. And so we're going to zoom in, zoom in here. <laughs> so if you can get that, if this is visible, these labels are visible. Um, This sound here starts with a t sound. Really, okay, so it's pretty convincing it's sort of t sound. Um, and then it seems to go into a sh sound. Um, so that may be turtle of a sh, could be a sh, right? Okay. And then we've got something which is a bit like an air or an ear. Okay. So it's not quite sure whether it's an air or an ear, they're about equal. So it's either chip or chip, right? And then we've got a Pretty sure that that will come back to the first sound, check, check. And then we've got another, definitely an ear sound now, we've got coming up. And then we've got a no sound. Really, so what do you think? So what do you think this, this particular phrase should say? Chicken. 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 Chicken.
Um, and here we've got something which says, I've got either, it looks like I've got a dir sound here, a dir sound here, and then an ir sound here, and then a sh sound here. So I've got dir, ir, sh, and that's what I've got. So we've lost the shoe over. We went through this whole process. These days the chicken neck is a rare dish. These days the chicken neck is a rare dish. So this is the beginning of most applications that study pronunciation, computer applications that study pronunciation. The first task is to work out for each particular moment in time what is the probability of each particular phonetic unit being present at that um, and if you were doing a speech recognition system, you'd say, well, what words would, would that, what words could I use to you know, part through this and to use all these particular, uh, these particular sounds that you found, and you'd use the pronunciations of words in English, uh, and you look at the probability of one word, particular words following each other in English, and then you've come up with a, uh, a hypothesis for this particular phrase. If you're doing a pronunciation training, you might compare this map to one that's being produced by a native speaker. We might have uh, predict what the what this map should look like for a native speaker, and then you can compare this map to the one that a native speaker actually produced. The, to, to, to compare the, the predicted map to the one that the learner actually produced. I want to give you um, one quick last in I've got no time left, but it's worth just seeing how this would all come together. <clears throat> so I'm just going to show you a, a, a quick demo a live demo, which is probably a mistake, of, um, uh, of uh, a pronunciation assessment tool called Speechase. And I'm just going to see if we can get this to follow. Respond to my checking. Simple sentences. <coughs> So it's looking for, looking for me to say, I will look in my desk. I will look in my desk. And so I've got 98% of my And uh, so let's, let's make a deliberate mistake. <coughs> so uh, my grandma will make a cake. So let's say, um, let's, let, let's, uh, let, let's mispronounce make. And mispronounce. <coughs> my grandma will mark the cake. Uh, I've got 94% on that. Uh, but if you look, you see this underlined make, which is in red, and it says, it expected A, and the M and the K were good, um, but the A sound sounded a bit like R for some reason. So instead of me, I said, Mark. Well, dear, I've definitely got it wrong. <laughs> um, so I've still got 94%, so I've got that sandwich here. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have time, so I'm going to. Um, <clears throat> okay, I mean, uh, this whole area is uh, about um, using instrumental and quantitative methods for work in the study of the scientific studies. And if you think about it, there's all kinds of ways in which we might apply this within speech communication, just looking at how sounds vary in context, how sounds vary depending on who you're speaking to, or the context in which you're speaking, what's the speaking style, how speech varies according to your emotional state, you're happy, sad, tired, you know, bored, angry, and so on, um, how speech varies from one speaker to another, how is one person saying something different from how another person says something in the same same uh, language and accent. Well, how does two accents uh, vary, vary with, uh, from, from, from each other within the same language? Well, how do the same things that we think of as the same phonological contrasts are different in, in, in one language as opposed to another? And uh, these are all areas that where a quantitative study of, of, of speech communication can give you insights and they're all based on instrumental studies of speech sound. So if you're interested at all in the topics of today, um, there are some resources listed on the handout. Um, there's some these websites of, of mine, Fond, what you see on the basic book is the 
is the phonetics uh, website, UCL, and speechandhearing.net is uh, my website where I put uh, a lot of programs and stuff. And in fact, all of those demos that I've given you today, you can find on speechandhearing.net. And if you want a little book, this is very old now, but it is a very gentle introduction to the nature of speech. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.